Hello, I'm Crispin Blunt. I'm the Member of Parliament for Reigate, and I'm also the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Drug Policy Reform, and I chair the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group Limited. It was my pleasure in September last year, uh, on behalf of the APPG, uh, to host a presentation by uh, the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group about the need uh, to get psilocybin and indeed the other psychedelics rescheduled under British law to enable uh, research and science uh, to proceed uh, and for us to begin to unlock the undoubted significant uh, medical benefits, particularly in the area of mental health uh, potential uh, for British patients. The presentation was a joint one to the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Mental Health as well. And uh, this paper, uh, work done over the uh, preceding uh, year by the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, bringing together all the experts in the field who it's been my uh, privilege to meet, uh, to make clear that this case is really an overwhelming one. Uh, we then uh, presented it to Kit Malthouse, as you can see in this photograph, uh, and uh, the work continues on, really on all fronts uh, to make this case, whether it's to number 10, whether it's in the area of regulatory reform, uh, or whether it's within the Department of Health, uh, to make clear uh, that Britain has got to unlock uh, the potential here for our own uh, bioscience industry, for our own uh, psychotherapists to be able to effectively treat British patients. And if Britain is serious about leading in the area of medicine and the bioscience, uh, we're going to move our regulatory uh, regime uh, to enable safe application uh, of these uh, revolutionary new medicines. My name is Dr. James Rucker. I'm a consultant psychiatrist who specialises in the treatment of depression. I'm also a senior clinical lecturer at King's College London, leading a research group specialising in clinical trials of novel treatments in psychiatry. Every two seconds, someone in the world attempts to commit suicide. Every 40 seconds, someone succeeds. I think we should all remember that suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 50 and one of the biggest killers in women too. Half of all suicides are associated with clinical depression. Indeed, if you have a diagnosis of clinical depression, then you are 20 times more likely to take your own life than someone without that diagnosis. About 2.5 million people suffer with clinical depression in the UK. About a third of those, 800,000 or so, suffer with so-called treatment-resistant depression. This means they don't get better despite the usual medical and psychological treatments. They are much more likely to be chronically ill, much more likely to be economically inactive, and even more likely to die by suicide with all the devastation that act leaves behind. You might think in 2020 that we have lots of new treatments to offer these 800,000 people with treatment resistant depression. Sadly, this is not the case. In my NHS clinic, we offer lithium antipsychotics and electroconvulsive therapy. These old treatments either have high burdens of side effects or are generally unacceptable to patients or both. The point is that modern pharmaceutical companies have failed to develop treatments that are any better than Prozac, which has now been on the market for over 30 years. We can and must do better. Prior to 1971, psychedelic drugs like psilocybin were used as medical treatments in the UK, Europe and the US. Entire hospital blocks were devoted to psychedelic therapy. In a peer-reviewed systematic review of the evidence from that period, we found that nearly 80% of patients with chronic depressive illness were clinically improved after treatment with psychedelics like psilocybin. This effect was often seen after just one or two treatment sessions. Patients reported the effect as being like years of psychotherapy in a single day. However, psilocybin, like all classical psychedelics, was caught up in the US-led war on drugs in the 1960s. Following suit, in 1971, the UK classified psilocybin within Schedule 1 of the Misuse of Drugs Act, thus legally designating it as being not for medical use, despite the fact that it did have a use. The effect of Schedule 1 was and 
is to prohibit all medical personnel from writing prescriptions for psilocybin unless they have a home office license. What this meant in practice is that from 1971, all medical use of this effective treatment modality ceased. No new research was allowed. Despite Schedule 1 restriction, restrictions, recently we have completed good quality but small scale clinical trials with psilocybin. The results from those trials suggest that this treatment is likely to be much better than existing treatments for depression, whilst being safe when given in a medically controlled setting and acceptable to patients. The results also indicate that psilocybin may be a safe and effective treatment for anxiety disorders, traumatic stress disorders, addictions, and other mental illnesses that are common, costly, disabling, and also associated with high rates of suicide. The problem we bring to you is that in the face of Schedule 1 restrictions, further clinical development work of psilocybin is almost impossible. Schedule 1 imposes bureaucratic and practical restrictions that make clinical trials with it much more expensive than they need to be and much too difficult for most research institutions to undertake. However, Schedule 1 restrictions are not necessary because psilocybin is not dangerous and it is not addictive. We are asking for psilocybin to be placed in the same schedule as medical heroin. Medical heroin has an accepted medical use and therefore UK doctors do not need a license from the Home Office to prescribe it and hospital pharmacies may hold it again without a Home Office license. If restrictions are eased in this way, it will give the UK life sciences industry a jump start in this promising area of treatment research. This is a treatment that has the potential to bring real world benefit to patients, the UK's research reputation and life sciences economy alike. Today, from many perspectives, this is surely needed. I have worked as a psychiatrist for nearly 20 years. I'm an expert in the treatment of mood disorders. I'm pretty skeptical by and large, fads come and go, but I can definitely say that this is the most promising new treatment for a generation. Furthermore, the UK is poised to, to lead the way in this new science with all the benefits that this will bring, if the government can give us the jumpstart we need by reconsidering the Schedule 1 status of psilocybin. A new wave of opportunity is building. The UK can and should catch this wave. In the time it has taken me to read this to you, four people with clinical depression have successfully killed themselves. Psilocybin therapy is the most promising new treatment for decades, bringing with it the economic and reputational benefits associated with leading the world in this new area. But we can only develop it successfully if the schedule is changed. This is what we are asking for your help with. Thank you for listening and for your consideration. Hi, my name is Michael Bourne. I'm 57 years old, and for most of my adult life, I've suffered with depression. It has severely impacted the quality of my social and work life for as far back as I can remember. Unfortunately, decades ago, depression wasn't really given any kind of equality with physical illness, and in a lot of cases, and in the workplace especially, it was seen as a weakness, which of course further exacerbates the condition. Depression often leads to poor physical health as well, over or under eating, addiction issues and suicide. Unless you've suffered with it, it's very difficult to convey to people exactly how bad it is. From my perspective, it was that nothing in life offered any kind of real joy. Everything just seemed to be a mindless slog towards an uncertain and unhappy future. I was offered and took many prescription drugs which had little or no effect. They only seemed to do anything when the dosages were increased to such a level as to make me feel disconnected from everything and all emotion. It's a horrible state of mind. Many key moments in life just didn't register as being anything special. I tried several talking therapies, which ultimately didn't help me progress, especially CBT therapy, which I found both intrusive and patronizing, like a one-size-fits-all approach. My depression came to a head when I became my mom's carer. She had cancer, and we weren't sure how long she had left. Although I managed to keep it together for her during her hospital visits and her many episodes of extreme pain, watching her pass away and losing her mind before then, when the bone cancer had put holes in her skull, 
cut me up. A year later, I found a new friend and everything looked better. I worked with her on a children's book website. We lost touch for a couple of months and then I found out she'd taken her own life. I hit absolute rock bottom. I didn't know which way to turn. Medical professionals were beyond useless dealing with my depression. I was turned away from receiving help via NHS because I didn't have substance issues or have any violent tendencies. GPs were unsympathetic and they put me forward for some CBT, which I grew to hate. Then, by chance, I spotted an article about clinical trials of psilocybin and how it has been touted as a help for people with treatment-resistant depression. It caught my interest because I tried magic mushrooms as a teenager and I was curious as to how this might work. My main thought was that it was something different and if nothing else had worked, I'd give it a go. I contacted Imperial College. I wasn't convinced they'd let me take part as I was so far from London and I didn't have the finance to travel or stay there. I heard nothing for a long time and then I got an email asking if I'd be prepared to come down and talk to them. They offered to pay the expenses and I was interested, but hesitant. The best I thought that could happen was that I'd maybe feel better for a week or maybe a little longer. I also thought that if I didn't try this and it did work, then I'd have missed a chance to shake off this awful illness. It would take too long to explain the events that took place, but they transformed my life. I remember arriving in London before the trial started, sat outside King's Cross, looking at people laughing and smiling with their friends and families, thinking, why can't I have that? I cynically put it down to them having no money worries and better opportunities in life. After my first treatment, everything changed, and literally within the same day. The experience transformed the way I thought. It put a whole new perspective on things. I felt alive, joyous, wanting to engage with everyone and everything. It made me appreciate the tiniest things in life, the beauty of nature, the wonder of music. I felt about 40 years younger. I don't mean just while I was having the experience, I mean afterwards. I then remember arriving at King's Cross again to return home and just being so happy with the variety of people there. I talked to complete strangers and smiled with them. I'd never felt more confident or content in such a long time, perhaps even ever. Because I was still midway through the seat that had started just before the trial, I went back to talk to the therapist, who was completely taken aback at the difference in me. She was dumbfounded and asked me more about the trial and said that there was no need for any more sessions as I was cured. The effect of the treatment lasted well over a year. Gradually things started to slide back down again, but I felt more able to cope with them when they did. I have not taken any antidepressants or have any talking therapy since this trial and it is now over five years ago. Above all, rescheduling psilocybin is an absolute necessity. The research work undertaken by James Rooker and others is critical to finding solutions to this horrendous condition. It also shows so much promise in other areas also, such as end-of-life care. I am absolutely convinced my mum would, would have had the opportunity for a psilocybin experience before passing. It could have helped her so much with her anxiety about her end of life. To suggest that it has no medicinal benefit is both blinkered and immoral. Research needs to be done in quantity and very quickly. COVID has, from my experience, affected the mental health of so many and no doubt driven people with chronic depression at a breaking point. Treating depression also helps with the physical problems that go with depression. Transforming people's lives and giving people a brighter, more hopeful future is the key to bigger and better and much more tolerant societies. My name is Ainsley Coors and I am the Vice President representing a non-profit organisation called Cluster Busters. I am a 35 year survivor of a deep brain neurological disorder called cluster headaches, also known as suicide headaches. At Cluster Busters, we support research for better treatments and eventually finding a cure, whilst advocating and educating to improve the lives of those with cluster headaches. Our board of directors comprises of patient advocates with first hand experience of cluster headaches. We have spent many, many years fighting to bring awareness of our condition um, under the leadership of Mr. Bob Wald, 
who founded Cluster Busters in 2002. Many individuals with cluster headaches respond very favorably to using alternative medication in the form of the naturally occurring ingredient of magic mushrooms, namely psilocybin. After so many patients, myself included, exhausted all pharma options, many of these meds greatly exacerbating the condition and some even inducing um, non-cluster related health issues, uh, have found that cluster, uh, sorry, that psilocybin has saved tens of thousands of people unnecessary pain and suffering. Not only does it work for the debilitating physical nature of cluster headaches, it has proven to greatly improve the psychological impact that goes hand in hand with this condition. I would like to share an image with you now. It will be shocking for you to see, but it will go a long way in explaining why these suicide headaches are so named and why the medical profession declares cluster headache as the most painful condition a human can endure. The image that you see now is a 56 year old male with a history of chronic cluster headaches for nine years. His clinical severity suffered spontaneous worsening despite continued treatment with five pharma medications plus an injectable abortive tryptan drug. Over two weeks, he became extremely depressed and sleep deprived and during an acute nocturnal attack, he aimed a gun towards his symptomatic right eye and he fired. So this image is of a non-contrasted brain CT scan and it shows multiple metallic pellets present both extra and intracranially. Amazingly, this patient survived and at discharge exhibited no significant neurological deficit. Now, sadly, this is just one of many harrowing images that we have seen, and it's so powerful in explaining, without words, why cluster headaches carry a suicide rate of 20 times the national average. Cluster Busters fully supports the rescheduling of psilocybin in the UK, and we hope that this campaign will encourage other countries to follow suit. Of course, we understand that the use of psilocybin does carry judgment. People do find it hard to believe that the usage of psilocybin recreationally, why would people break the law purely to self-medicate? The class one status of psilocybin is a major factor in many patients being too frightened to explore and pursue what has been shown to be the most successful treatment so far. I thank you for the opportunity to share with you today and talk about the life impacting nature of cluster headaches and highlight a little bit of what cluster busters do, both within the UK and worldwide with our patient led advocacy and awareness work. We look forward to working closely with your campaign moving forward. Thank you. My name is Guy Murray. I'm a veteran former soldier serving in 4th Battalion of the Rifles. I started in 2008 and I left in 2014. During that time, I served in Afghanistan. Uh, I served, I did one year's worth of training before I was out in Sangin Valley, Helmand Province. The tour was dubbed one of the bloodiest tours of Afghanistan. Um, and it, it was it was pretty hectic. I got out there and I found out that I was going to be a valor man. So I was giving a metal detector. Um, I, was, I was pretty good at it, I guess, at training. And yeah, then it fell on, fell on me to walk out in front of um, a fighting patrol and search for improvised explosive devices. During that tour, I witnessed my friend uh, fighting in a in a battle. Um, they'd gone out on patrol, all hell had broke loose, and my friend Andy was shot through the back. He had to roll into cover, get treatment, and my friend was providing covering fire 
at this point, I was looking through a set of binoculars, kind of cheering him on. Um, and unfortunately, I watched as a bullet went through his face um, and he was killed instantly. In that moment, it was like the world began to swirl around me. I became very dissociative. I use the analogy, I was like a bird who just flew into the window and dropped onto the floor. I was in a sanger, so I dropped onto the floor in that sanger and I just, I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't process what was going on. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go back and repatriate Martin Kingert. Um, he was my best friend. He was the one that I started this training and everything with. And worse than that, I had to stay out there for another three months. Um, and not being able to process it whilst you're out there means that you have to internalize it, compartmentalize it, and just become very dissociative from your emotions. So I had that trapped in me for the rest of the tour. We got back to England and then it was, you know, the flags came out. We, we were kept marching. We had adventure training, all these things to keep us moving. Um, and for a couple of years, I was okay. Um, and then I went to go for officer selection. So I'd been a non-commissioned officer and I was asking to go to Sandhurst. I'd already been promoted once. And uh, one of the interviews with the commanding officer at the time asked me, what were the nationalities of the people who flew the Twin Towers into the, uh, through the plane into the Twin Towers? Just as like a role play, if I was gonna be an officer, they wanted me to be up to date on my sort of, um, you know, uh, current world affairs. And I couldn't answer. And in that moment, because I couldn't answer, it made me question myself, like, why was I out there then? And it just toppled that, that top card. And as I went away, it was like, well, then why did Martin have to die? And like the next layer dropped and then the next layer, and the next layer. My mind became, it became unraveled. Um, and I didn't get the treatment, the help from the doctors um, in the army. They said that I was just demotivating my work role. Um, it was very dismissive about um, my, I was close to tears all the time. And I went away traveling. I left the army after that. I was like, I can't become that officer. I can't become that person, lead the same guys down the same route if I don't know what I'm fighting for. So I left the army, went traveling and I came back. Um, and just at the point where I thought, you know, this is, I'm not enjoying life anymore. I want to move away from life. I want to rub myself out of existence. Not necessarily kill myself, but still petrified of death. Um, so I was kind of stuck in this, this limbo state of not knowing what to do. Luckily, I got involved with the Samaritans or I was messaging them. And I eventually found TED Talks on psilocybin and how it treats depression. Um, since then, I've gone to university, I've studied psychology, and at the same time, I've studied psilocybin, the literature. I went away to Scotland, and I foraged mushrooms by myself because I couldn't find anyone in the country who was going to help me use them adequately and safely. And then eventually, I went away to a guided experience with LSD in Barcelona. Both times gave me profound insight into what was going on. I could see how my PTSD diagnosis was holding me back. It was like a lens that I could only look through and how I needed to, and in the trip and during the trip, how I could change my perspective and understand that my thoughts were creating this victim narrative. Um, and then by the end of the sort of those two experiences, I had completely removed big trauma set it to one side and then I could understand myself without the victim narrative and then since then it's been like one year since I've done this um, the subsequent sort of or the post-traumatic growth has been amazing life-changing um, just understanding myself understanding my attachments my relationships toward, relationships towards other people and how that creates the world around me And I'm glad that I've been given this chance to sort of talk about it um, to the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group because I need to express how life-changing this has been for me and how I believe it's life-changing 
how it can be life changing and different for other people if they use the medicine. Um, and now this is my this is my purpose. I want to help people find the medicine. That's why I work for Heroic Heart Heroic Heart Project UK. Um, and yeah, so I'm I'm here today saying that I'm a firm believer that psilocybin should be rescheduled to to a schedule two substance so that we can start researching this. I, I, I strongly believe that it's the future for at least treatment resistant PTSD, at least, but for many more emotional disorders. My name is Jo Neal. I'm Professor of Psychopharmacology at the University of Manchester, um, conducting research into all, all kinds of new treatments for psychiatric disorder. In this context, I'm working on cannabinoids, but specifically on psychedelics. Due to my own experience of trying to research Schedule 1 drugs, I decided to conduct a research study at Manchester, uh, a qualitative study where we interviewed researchers up and down the country about their uh, experiences of working with Schedule 1 drugs. Let me explain that Psilocybin, LSD, MDMA are in Schedule 1 of the misuse of drugs regulations. Other illegal drugs such as heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, uh, ketamine, fencyclidine, which is, is very similar to ketamine and I use a lot in my research, these are all in Schedule 2 of the misuse of drugs regulations. To conduct research as academics, um, or people working in the NHS. We do not need any special permission from the Home Office or other regulatory bodies to conduct research into Schedule 2 drugs. So I've been working with Schedule 2 drugs all my research career without any problems. To research a drug that is in Schedule 1, you have to have special permission from the Home Office. So you have to possess a controlled drugs license. And the Home Office's stance when we ask them to give us research exemptions for Schedule 1 drugs is that we can do this research, all we need to do is get a controlled drugs license. So I want to explain the barriers to research caused by drugs being in Schedule 1 and caused by us having to get this special permission from the Home Office. Our research identified four main barriers, significant cost, very long delays in getting the license, which means you cannot start research until you get the license, an enormous amount of bureaucracy and a considerable amount of stigma. So let's consider each aspect um, individually so that we have a really good understanding of where these barriers are coming from. So first of all, let's look at cost. So I'm an animal researcher. It costs me £3,000 for the controlled drugs license. You have to have special locked and alarmed uh, cabinets to store these drugs in, even though we have um, locked cabinets to store Schedule 2 drugs in, but it has to be alarmed and a special um, type of cabinet or fridge to keep your Schedule 1 drug in. So that costs money. Um, you have to have special trained personnel to destroy the drug once you've finished your research study and specialised kits. So for all these extra checks and balances, that costs a lot of money as well. So the researchers that we interviewed, uh, for many people, that was too much trouble and far too much money for them out of their small research budget. So that we find that many people who should be doing this research were not, largely because of this cost. So I'm an animal researcher. We interviewed clinicians, um, part of the psilocybin depression trial running in the UK at the moment. In particular, we find that in one study, the clinician had to have six separate controlled drugs licenses. So that's £3,000 for each license. Uh, and that, so that's at least £20,000 because he has to have a pharmacy keeping the drug. He has to put the drug into capsules. 
that's another license. The study has to be blinded. The drug has to be where the patients are. That's another license. So that's at least £20,000. That's without all the extra fridges and alarms that um, have to be provided in each location because each location needs its own controlled drugs license. So that is at least £20,000 out of his research budget before he even gets the drug anywhere near a patient. That's an enormous amount of money. And this, uh, very often the research is funded by the taxpayer. So this is, is taxpayer's money. And I don't know, but I, I do wonder where all that money um, goes to. It should at least come back to research, in my view. So that's cost, and that is significant. And let's be clear that that cost will put an awful lot of people off. What about the delays? Um, our research revealed that delays of six months were the minimum. I myself had to wait a year. Thinking about um, somebody like um, James Rucker at King's working on an MRC grant that are, are traditionally last for three years, that's a year out of his research time before he can even start this research. That is a completely unacceptable delay. There's an awful lot of bureaucracy. We spoke to a, a team working up in Newcastle and it took them at least a week to fill in the necessary paperwork just to apply for the controlled drugs license. So that's, that's a, your external form for the home office. That's nothing to do with all the internal extra bureaucracy that you have when working with a schedule one drug. That requires one person for a whole week working full time on this. The holder of the license has to have a DBS check. Again, that's more delay and that is more cost. There is an awful lot of fear around working with a Schedule 1 drug from every aspect of um, people involved with the trial, people handling the drug, people on the ethics committees, and that in itself causes a lot of difficulty bureaucracy, delay, and a lot more work and time. So let's be very clear that there's an awful lot of extra time bureaucracy um, involved in applying for a controlled drugs license. If you have to be inspected by the Home Office, uh, which we currently are waiting for an inspection, that you have to pay for that inspection yourself. And that again, incurs significant delays. So what we are asking government to do is to um, give academics and NHS researchers an exemption to um, research to these these um, difficulties or these extra checks and balances, which frankly we don't need and are confusing for many academics. We would like research exemption to enable us to research schedule one drugs as easily as we can schedule two drugs. Of course, we are incredibly careful with all chemicals and all drugs that we use. Um, you know, the university and, and labs are full of dangerous chemicals and we are very used to being very, very careful. So there are a number of ways in which having to have a controlled drugs license to research a schedule one drug is a barrier to research. Many people will not do this research and we find that the, the smaller universities in particular will not consider doing this research because they do not have the funding and they do not have the staff who will help them with the, all the administration and the bureaucracy um, required. So that really provides uh, or creates a haves and a have nots in this system in people who, who can do this research and people who cannot, and that is completely unacceptable. And the, the government have um, launched their life sciences sector deal. Uh, we need to reinvigorate the UK economy. Clearly the life sciences is one of our huge strengths in the UK, but researching schedule one drugs that have enormous therapeutic potential for treating the mental health crisis in particular that will be coming as a result of COVID, um, there are these enormous restrictions. So we, and, th and that is really a shameful situation um, for researchers to be in, which is why we're asking government 
to reschedule um, psychedelics and certain can cannabis products, at least, to, or at least to give us a research exemption. Um, thank you. My name is Dr. Ben Sesser. I'm a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I have been working clinically as a doctor since 1997 in traditional psychiatric service with children, young people and adults. I'm also an addiction psychiatrist working with adults with a range of different forms of uh, substance misuse problems. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've been involved in the academic field alongside Professor David Nutt at Bristol University, Cardiff University and Imperial College London. During that time, I've carried out projects with LSD and psilocybin and DMT and ketamine and MDMA. Um, but my heart is very much in clinical medicine and delivering treatments to patients, not exploring academia. Um, what has happened in recent years is I've had the opportunity to open a new clinical service um, and we have a company called Awaken Life Sciences and we are on the verge of opening our first physical building here in Bristol, delivering psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, initially with ketamine and then with MDMA and psilocybin as these compounds become available. We will also be providing training for therapists to become psychedelic therapists as many thousands of such therapists will be required in coming years as these drugs become approved. And we are opening a small independent clinical research unit what drives me is that traditional models of psychiatry are failing our patients. Most long-term chronic mental health problems are driven by rigid narratives formed very early in life, um, usually as a result of child maltreatment and adverse childhood experiences. And the result is the patient forms very uh, difficult to shift narratives about themselves and the world. And this is what makes most mental illnesses chronic and unremitting. Um, these people are a tremendous burden upon the mental health service in terms of financially, not to mention their own personal distress. And our current treatment modalities are poor and failing them. But what we tend to do is use a top-down biological psychiatry model to provide daily maintenance therapies with drugs such as SSRIs, which do not get to the root cause of the problem, which is usually trauma. Um, we just paper over the cracks and treat the symptoms. And therefore patients remain in services for uh, their whole lives. Um, this is both ethically and morally wrong, but also financially a very poor model of doing mental health. Now what the psychedelic medicines offer are the most innovative and uh, far reaching attempt to change the entire paradigm of how we do psychiatry. Um, the psychedelic experience allows the patient to address and explore and resolve these um, difficult to shift narratives for the first time in their life. Um, I'm a registered MDMA and approved psilocybin therapist and I've seen these treatments work firsthand. There's also a plethora of data from multiple studies around the world um, demonstrating the safety and efficacy of these treatments. Nevertheless, we are several years away from getting full approval from MHRA, uh, FDA and EMA for these drugs to be used in clinical medicine. I'm very keen on finding a way forward to get past this uh, bottleneck. In the next few years, whilst we're waiting for full approval for psilocybin, we're going to see increasing numbers of deaths and misery and distress and financial burden of chronic unremitting mental disorders that we are quite convinced would respond extremely well and quickly to psychedelic therapies with psilocybin. I would like to work with authorities to find a creative mechanism to start using psilocybin ahead of approval. This has been done in other countries in which psilocybin has been used for compassionate use on a named patient basis for patients who are willing to go through um, a treatment protocol with an unlicensed medicine. And I am quite convinced there are many such patients who are willing to do this. Um, such an approach is not novel. Um, it happens quite frequently, particularly with oncology drugs. When a drug is in the final stages, the uh, late phase two or early phase three stages of development, and it's being shown to be safe and efficacious, 
there's often a, a kind of patient power lobby um, from the patients saying, we don't want to have to wait the, for another three years for full approval. Um, we would like to start using this medicine right away under strict, scrutinized, carefully monitored medical protocols. What we would like the government to be considering is, can we come up with a similar such scheme for psilocybin? Um, it's still many, many years away of collecting the full data, but to wait that long, we will see thousands of deaths and thousands of more cases of distress and chronic mental disorders taking hold that we believe we can start to tackle right away. In the context of COVID, we undoubtedly have the worst to come when it comes to the social, economic and psychological manifestations of this, this pandemic. Um, so now really is the time to start thinking innovatively about opportunities to tackle this problem um, rather than waiting for the problem to get worse. We have a physical platform in our cl clinic in Bristol to start doing this. Um, we will be beginning our work with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy because that's the only approved psychedelic drug that's on the market to date. Um, but it is not, in my personal opinion, my preferred compound. Um, I'm much more keen on pushing forward MDMA psilocybin-assisted therapies. So if we can work with government groups to find a mechanism to provide psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy out of our service in Bristol as soon as possible, it will really push this field forward. We would also be able to provide safety data on an ongoing basis, which will assist towards the approval process in the coming years. But for me, the most important thing is actually getting these patients through the door and getting them treated with safe and efficacious protocols that we know are going to improve the quality of their lives. Hello, my name is Rudy Fortson. I'm a practicing barrister and a visiting professor of law at Queen Mary University of London. In recent years, there has been much discussion about moving cannabis from Schedule 1 to another schedule within the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001 in order to facilitate the prescribing of cannabis for medicinal use. It is often said that moving cannabis from Schedule 1 to, say, Schedule 2 would make prescribing easier. In fact, this is a considerable oversimplification because there is another piece of legislation, namely the Human Medicines Regulations 2012, that makes provision for the production, supply and prescribing of medicinal products. And it also creates the regime for granting medicinal products a marketing authorization by which such products may be placed on the UK market. Medicinal products that have a marketing authorization are easier to prescribe than those that do not, and which are subject to a separate regime in respect of so-called specials. The latter regime is very limited in scope, and it is very tightly regulated. Now, before going into details, let me say a few words about the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. It often gets a bad press, and it is frequently described as an instrument of prohibition. But in fact, the Act was intended to be forward-thinking and to be flexible. Thus, the Act talks about the misuse of drugs rather than speaking of dangerous drugs. The classification of drugs as forming classes A, B and C was intended to say something about the relative harm of drugs within each class. Although the Act creates prohibitions, its associated 2001 regulations are entirely permissive, enabling specified persons to handle controlled drugs in the circumstances set out in the regulations. Furthermore, the Act created the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, and one of its many tasks is to keep under review those drugs likely to be misused and capable of having harmful effects sufficient to constitute a social problem. 
So when one reads the Act together with the regulations, the whole idea was to set up a structure that would enable Parliament to operate it in a flexible way as uh, the needs of society uh, changed. So the Misuse of Drugs Act avoids the language of prohibition. And when you look at subheadings to the various sections in the 1971 Act, it refers to restrictions on possession, supply, cultivation, and so on. Furthermore, the Act empowers the Secretary of State to permit things to be done by licence or by way of other authority. And the Secretary of State is required to make regulations to permit uh, medical practitioners to supply and to possess controlled drugs when acting uh, in their respective capacities. There is an exception, namely where it's in the public interest for the supply or possession of certain drugs to be unlawful or unlawful save for the purposes of research or other special purposes or when acting under license or other authority issued by the Secretary of State. And this is important in the context, for example, of medicinal cannabis before we had the 2018 regulations. And I've no doubt that it was this particular provision that enabled the Secretary of State at the time to grant um, permission to doctors to prescribe cannabis as a special um, because that would be, it would be in the public interest for the supply to take place uh, in, for example, urgent or critical cases. Schedule 1 drugs include drugs such as cannabis, uh, psilocybin and LSD. And it's often said that drugs in Schedule 1 have no recognised medicinal value. In fact, that is an overstatement. The legislation itself makes no such reference to drugs lacking medicinal value. The likely explanation for including drugs in Schedule 1 was Parliament's hope that less harmful but equally efficacious drugs would eventually be discovered. So for example, rather than prescribing cannabis, uh, the scientists might discover another drug that would be safer but equally efficacious or more efficacious than cannabis, and that that drug could be prescribed. So what are the barriers to licensing a product for medicinal use? Let's take a cannabis-based medicinal product. Well, there are a number of potential barriers, and in relation to cannabis, one is simply a matter of policy. Uh, the concern that's often expressed that... Um, making cannabis readily available for medicinal use might simply be to open the back door to recreational use. And then there is, of course, the need to establish or to find evidence to establish drug safety and drug efficacy. Then there's the question of med medical and professional ethics. And certainly a number of uh, general practitioners that I've spoken to have expressed considerable reservations about prescribing cannabis, even if it was open them to, to do so. Sometimes concern being expressed about um, the potential for, for psychotic conditions to manifest themselves if cannabis were to be prescribed on a regular basis. How well founded those concerns are uh, is really beyond my pay grade. Now, it may be said that cannabis has been placed into Schedule 1 of the 2001 regulations in order for the United Kingdom to meet its treaty obligations under the 1961 UN Single Convention. Well, it is true that cannabis and cannabis resin appear in Schedule 4 to that convention, which specifies the tightest measures of control applicable to drugs in that schedule. However, you will see that Article 2.5 of that convention is actually quite open textured and thus a party shall adopt any special measures of control which, in its opinion, are necessary having regard to the particularly dangerous properties 
of a drug so included, and a party shall, if in its opinion, so there's quite a high level of uh, state autonomy involved in this, if in it, its opinion the prevailing conditions in its country render it the most appropriate means of protecting the public health and welfare, prohibit the production, manufacture, export and import of trade in possession or use of any such drug, and then these important words of qualification, except for amounts which may be necessary for medical and scientific research only, including clinical trials therewith to be conducted under or subject to the direct supervision and control of the party. And therefore, in my view, it's perfectly uh, permissible and open to the United Kingdom to conduct clinical trials in respect to, for example, cannabis or even maybe LSD and psilocybin. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, the point that it makes is quite simply this. Although one could move a drug out of Schedule 1 and put it into another schedule, it doesn't mean to say that um, uh, therefore doctors are going to be able to simply prescribe a drug at will because we have, as I said already, the Human Medicines Regulations 2012 to, to consider. But in any event, the, the other schedules within the 2001 regulations set out different levels of control in respect of... Uh, uh, control drugs subject to the schedule in question. It is often said that drugs in Schedule 1 pose significant problems when seeking to carry out clinical and medical research. The first problem is getting a license to do so at all and that obtaining a license involves overcoming a considerable amount of red tape. It is also said that it is considerably more expensive to conduct research into a Schedule 1 drug than a drug that falls within Schedules 2 to 5. Well, as to whether those complaints are right or not, those are not really complaints that a lawyer can address. All one can say from a lawyer's point of view is this, that these are surely administrative matters. They're not really matters created by the legislation uh, itself. And therefore, one would hope that well, where there's a will, there would be a way in order to reduce costs, in order to make it easier for scientists and clinicians to carry out the research that ought to be undertaken. It's a great pleasure to join our other speakers to help raise your attention to this pressing problem. Although, may I add that we have arrived at this moment perhaps decades later than we should have. We all know that political decisions are made on much more than scientific evidence alone. Policies also need to be enforceable, risk averse, tolerable to the public, and in keeping with the broader strategies, commitments and values of the government. But policies that do not adapt at all to advances in the evidence base cannot and do not serve the public good. And that is why we're here today. Psilocybin is as strictly regulated today as it was 50 years ago. The decision made then was not based on any scientific evidence that it was a dangerous drug because that evidence did not exist. It was controlled partly due to pressure arising from sensationalist media stories and partly due to reports of unsafe medical practices from the United States. Little consideration was paid to the fact that psilocybin was used safely and effectively by clinical researchers around the world. Hansard records show that there was virtually no parliamentary debate concerning the regulatory status of psilocybin. It was a drug that was not widely known about, and it was shelved away into a regulatory niche with little scrutiny, where it gathered the proverbial dust for decades. Professor Neil has shared with us the impact that that has had on research. Today, we have quite a lot of evidence that psilocybin is associated with very low potential harms to society and the individual. That experience, that evidence, sorry, is epidemiological, experimental, and clinical. We also know that there's tremendous value in the research of psilocybin and other Schedule I drugs that act in a similar way. 
You've heard about this earlier from Dr. Rucker, a global expert in this field. And you've heard firsthand from Michael and Ainsley about how profoundly the drug can change the lives of individuals in acute distress. We propose that psilocybin and related drugs of high research value are urgently rescheduled to schedule two with statutory limits in place to restrict unlicensed access to ethically approved research studies. This would immediately improve availability for research without risking the diversion of drugs or inappropriate prescribing. We're not asking for market authorization. We are not asking for the standard of evidence for drug development to be lowered. We are only asking that drug scheduling is commensurate with the actual harms and benefits of the drug. Rescheduling requires Home Office Ministers to first commission the advice of the ACMD, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, and then issue a statutory instrument on the negative procedure. What that means is that decades of regulatory blocks could actually be lifted in weeks. And there's not a shred of evidence that doing so would cause any harm to the British public, but there is substantial evidence that doing so would benefit our research institutions our life sciences sector, and ultimately British, British patient, patients. Every single day that passes by while the government neglects this opportunity to reduce research barriers, 18 British citizens take their own lives. My mother was one of them. I know all too well the heartbreak of depression and the limits of existing therapies. Depression alone, which remains, as James told us, the leading cause of suicide, costs our society more than 27 million pounds every single day. Rudy has shown us that our drug laws were originally intended to be flexible to support legitimate research. If our regulations have delayed scientific breakthroughs for 50 years, it is not ethically, economically, or politically justifiable to wait any longer. Evidence-based regulation is not an unreasonable demand. Our drugs laws were designed to adapt to an evolving evidence base, but consecutive governments have failed to keep the regulations up to date. The ACMD have not been given the flexibility and the resources to challenge areas of drug policy that are over-regulated and scientifically unsound. The Home Office say that current policy does not get in the way that Schedule One controls do not hold up the necessary research in psilocybin. But we're telling you that they have and they still do. Today's speakers are global experts in conducting this research. Listen to them when they tell you that these regulations make their work substantially and often prohibitively harder than it has to be. This work changed lives. The Home Office will say that it's already looking into regulatory barriers, but no commission has yet been made to the ACMD to review the scheduling status of psilocybin and related drugs. Officials say that there is insufficient evidence to move psilocybin out of schedule one, but let me tell you, there is far more evidence to support doing so than there has ever been to justify putting it into schedule one in the first place. Evidence is indeed important but sadly, in regard to drugs policy, it is the elephant not in the room. All aspects of drug control should be open to criticism, monitored for effectiveness, responsive to change, and crucially, evidence-based. COVID-19 has challenged us all, and the government has a great deal of work to attend to. Psilocybin policy is considered a low priority, and it's falling through the cracks. So please support us to see this through. It will, it will be much less work for us all in the long run. It will benefit British citizens in every constituency in the nation. Please read our report, speak to the ministers, join us at a Westminster Hall debate, make your voice heard. We're depending on you. Please help us, help the government to do the right thing. Thank you.